you know, I learned this from my grandfather, who was an uneducated man, but he grew our vegetables, you know, as a family. And I was only three, and um, he said, today's the day we're going to plant the taters, which was the potatoes. And I said, why today, Gramps? And he took my hand and we walked outside and he looked up at the sky and he said, Wurr! and then he looked at the soil and he said, ah, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, that for me was one of the most important lessons I ever learned is that wisdom, which is what he had and experience does, can't always be explained. In, in you know we're we're living in a world of of evidence based decision making you know we can't make a decision unless you've got all the evidence well most of the really important decisions we make in our lives we have no evidence for welcome to the real organic podcast i'm lindley dixon co-director of the real organic project a grassroots farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label that distinguishes soil-grown crops and pasture-raised livestock. You just heard from Stuart Hill, Professor Emeritus of Social Ecology at the University of Western Sydney. Stuart is someone that you can't help but to learn from and be inspired by whenever he speaks. This is a rich discussion, but before we go there, let me ask you to please take a moment today to leave us a rating and review. Just that small action on your part will make a big difference to our efforts to grow our movement as we farmers stand up to corporate greenwashing under the organic label. Now let's get back to the conversation between my co-director Dave Chapman and the champion of soil, Stuart Hill. So Stuart Hill, it's a pleasure to be talking with you again. Um, we talked oh, a while back as I, I began talking to soil scientists about keeping the soil inorganic, and I had a great conversation with you. So, hello. Good to be here. Yeah. Um, so, Stuart, I, there are many, many new things to talk about in your life. New meaning in the last 20 years. Your thinking has continued to develop. But I would like to take a dive back first because we are dealing with issues in the Real Organic Project in which literally millions of people don't understand what organic means. And I know that you understand very well what it means and are more articulate than most at describing that. So can we go back to those days long ago when you were a professor of entomology at McGill and talk about, you, you became one of the first people from academia to cross the road and start coming to organic conferences and speaking at them and uh, sharing your, your uh, large knowledge base with us. So could you talk about that? What was that like? What, what drew you to organic? Um, I guess what happened was I did a study in a cave in Trinidad that had a quarter of a million bats in, and I looked at the total ecology of the cave and what became obvious was that most of the life in the cave was in the bat guano, which was enormous amount of stuff. So I ended up studying the life in the bat guano primarily, which turned out to be like a very, very fertile soil. So all my references were primarily from understanding life in the soil. Um, and because I had a very controlled environment, I was able to study what was going on in the soil in some ways much more easily than most people who are out there outside the cave <laughs> looking at life in the soil. And what was really clear was that, um, which I came to study much more subsequently, was that um, the, the animal life in the soil was essentially farming the microbes in the soil and that you could understand what was going on in the soil, particularly by understanding the animals, particularly the mites and springtails and nematodes and all these sort of things. And so when I finished this, um, 
there was only one person in the world who was a real leader, who had organized the first international conference on soil animal, soil, soil zoology. And um, I, I was at Reading University in England, and I wrote to this fellow whose name was Professor Keith Kevin, and uh, I said, I've selected you to work with next. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was happily quite impressed by this approach. So I went to work with him at McGill University, and he was a professor of entomology in, in the Faculty of Agriculture. And very quickly, I was absolutely horrified by how agriculture was taught that was basically um, bare soil systems, um, controlling things with inputs and so forth. And previously, I had been connected to people in Britain who had been the, the uh, protege of Sir Albert Howard, like Lady Eve Balfour was a friend and Mary Langman was her secretary and, and all the people that were associated with organics. So all of that orga organic stuff really made sense to me. And I read all of Howard's stuff and, and then all the other people. There were a whole lot of other people who wrote about things related to organics. And what was really coming through th from this whole process, that the whole system depended on the life in the soil and the, the health of the soil and the management of, of soil decomposition. And um, what I realized was that agriculture was the production of production, consumption, consumption and recycle. And that all the policies and practices in agriculture had essentially focused on, um, on how do you put inputs into the production process and how do you market the, the, the produce in the, in the consumption phase? But what was missing in, was a focus on the recycle bit, which was essentially getting organic matter back to the soil to feed the life in the soil to maintain the system. So what was missing was a whole focus on maintenance and an over-focus on production. Um, and so I got absolutely fascinated with the life in the soil. And I started doing studies on particularly soil animal ecology and particularly their relationship with the microbes and especially the, the relationships between microarthropods and fungi. So that so, was... Wonderful. And I want to go to that, but just to stop for a moment, just so that I think it's, we can make it clear because I think what you're proposing, which sounds like such a simple difference, but it's actually a profound difference in how you think about everything, yeah. how you think about the system, how you think about problems and opportunities. Am, am I getting that right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's um, the whole thing is about healthy system maintenance. And that requires what I'd call a front end approach is how do you do things in the design and management of the system to enable it to function well and function healthily and, and productively and all those things. Whereas what's happened primarily in our, our current systems is an over-focus on a back-end approach where we, we set up a highly controlled system um, and when things f fall apart, which they undoubtedly will, when you, you've got a simplified system uh, because you need a complex system for it to function, um, the whole focus then becomes what can we do to solve the problems, which is a sort of curative, reactive, back-end approach. Whereas what I was interested in, how do you design and manage that system, particularly the soil system to enable production. And when you do that, you can achieve production forever and ever. Whereas when you take a back-end approach, you've got a temporary system with 
with a decline in production over time, which can be compensated for a little bit by putting in inputs. But, but then eventually the system breaks down because there isn't the structure in the soil to maintain the system. And I, I remember in Canada where I was, I looked at what was happening and in the, I think it was the, the 60 years, no, the 30 years prior to me arriving there, um, in the prairies, they'd lost 60% of the organic matter content of the soil as a result of that, that approach. And w if you actually put a price on that, that was, that was actually multiple times the size of the national debt, <laughs> which people, the politicians were going on and on about the national debt, but they weren't really paying any attention to this much, much bigger debt that they were building up through their mismanagement of the agricultural system. So the, the conventional system, as it's called, one of the goals is to make the system ever simpler. I yeah. think of it as McDonald's. Yeah. You try to make it very, very simple and replicable so that it's always the same and you have the same inputs and you have the same outputs. And as I understand what you're saying, the organic system is about embracing complexity. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, if you, if you want an understanding of anything, um, the, the thing I would always recommend is look to the area where you can see it most easily. So if you think of human communities that only involve two people <laughs> or, <laughs> or only people that come from one particular persuasion, it very quickly gets really boring and <laughs> and you know if you, i mean the, the other example that's often made is if you were building an airplane you know and you only had people who knew how to make aircraft seats you wouldn't want to fly in it <laughs> you need the complexity of the the diversity to to set that whole thing up so it could actually fly and support people in the air um, the same process is going on in the soil and in the, in our natural systems. So my, my sort of take on this is anything you see anywhere is essentially what's going on everywhere because the whole planet functions holistically, even though we've brainwashed ourselves into thinking that we can simplify it. Um, we simplify at a cost. And the cost is, is a breakdown in maintenance functions. And it, you know, for a lot of people, it's an, it's, uh, sociologically and psychologically quite an interesting phenomena because historically in society, a lot of the maintenance functions were carried out by women, <laughs> not by men. Um, and they were largely unrecognized, unacknowledged, taken for granted, unpaid. Um, and that's sort of what's going on in agricultural systems that in, in some ways the life in the soil is a bit like the, the women from history who maintained homes <laughs> and, uh, and, and looked after things. And it was often an interesting thing for me. I would go traveling across North America giving workshops and I would stay with farm families and the farmer was producing food that was sold in the market. And we sat down to amazing meals and the, the wife would say, oh, no, we don't eat any of that stuff. I'd grow all the stuff that we eat. <laughs> I wouldn't yes. want to eat that stuff. <laughs> and yes. so there was this sort of split and, and yet an understanding of what was actually needed was a system that could produce the food that she produced, not the food that he was pr increasingly forced to produce to market stuff for the, for the masses, you know, so. You know, I grew up in uh, Lancaster County, County, Pennsylvania, and uh, the dairy farm I grew up on was surrounded by Amish farmers. Right. And my memory is that 
you know, they would, some of them were, were vegetable producers and they would grow conventionally, but their own garden was all organic. Yeah. What they ate out of. Yeah. And they felt uh, the economics were pushing them to the conventional production. It wasn't a matter of belief. Uh, they would choose to eat differently. Yeah. So, you know, we're all contending with these massive economic forces that seem to push us around often in directions that we don't want to go. That's absolutely true. I mean, that's, that's what the, the uh, political and social challenge is. How do you set up systems that can enable that sort of healthy production, not just in agriculture, but in everything, you know, in, in our education system, our health system, um, pretty much what's going on in, in agriculture of that sort of bare soil, row, row crop, single monoculture agriculture is pretty much what's going on in our health systems and our education systems and yeah. all our other systems. And, you know, when we have a, an issue like, like COVID and, and, um, bushfires and all these sort of things, which we've experienced in Australia, suddenly there's a, there's a sort of shock. How come we're being affected by this in this way? Um, well, the whole system is not set up to, to maintain health and well-being. It's, and it's set up to respond. But what's happened is now the, the problems have got larger and the, the requirement for that response is so enormous that it's becoming clear that we're no longer able to solve those problems at the back end. You know, we've got to solve them at the front end. And we're still a long, long way away from understanding that. Um, you know, I, I mean, for me, it was a, a medical doctor who, friend who said it like this. Think of it like this. He said, you don't suffer from a headache because of a deficiency of aspirin in the blood. And that's what we're trying to do in solving all our problems is that curative back end sort of solution. Whereas what's needed is to ask the question, you know, what do we need to do to stop getting headaches? <laughs> and what do we need to do to stop um, losing organic matter from the soil and putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and causing climate change and setting up systems that uh, uh, facilitate spreads of viruses <laughs> and and and, pro and produce students in schools who can't think you know who who can pass exams but can't think and uh, you know and, and and political systems that that vote in idiots for leadership you know, we've, we're a long way, we've got a long way to go to understand that, that need for a, essentially a front end approach. And, and can you say once again, uh, rem remind me a front end approach means? Well, for agriculture, it means how do you, uh, what do you need to do? to enable the soil to be healthy and that what you need to do is is return and and facilitate the addition of organic matter to the soil and manage that soil in a way that facilitates decomposition the decomposition process which involves all the organisms in the soil the the microbes and the animals and and so forth um, and that involves an understanding of time and place and, and working with complexity. So I remember, you know, I learned this from my grandfather who was an uneducated man, but he grew our vegetables, you know, as a family. And I was only three and, um, he said, today's the day we're going to plant the taters, which was the potatoes. And I said, why today, Gramps? And he took my hand and we walked outside and he looked up at the sky and he said, Wah! and then he looked at the soil and he said, ah, <laughs> and 
you know, that for me was one of the most important lessons I ever learned is that wisdom, which is what he had, and experience, does, can't always be explained. In, in, you know, we're, we're living in a world of, of evidence-based decision-making. You know, we can't make a decision unless you've got all the evidence. Well, most of the really important decisions we make in our lives, we have no evidence for. You know, the, the person we fall in love with, um, it was a, it was an intuitive, emotional experience, a, a, a piece of artwork that you love. Um, you've got no evidence for, for what, what was special about it. You know, it's, it's, um, it, it's a whole, a whole process that involves wisdom and experience and emotion. And those are the important things, you know. I think it, it was a, um, a person who, who visualized this for me best. He, he had a, a, there was a book called Soil, Grass and Cancer. And by, um, I've forgotten the author for a second, but, um, he was the, the father of rotational grazing, really, before, um, uh, well, holistic resource management and all these people. Um, Boisson, maybe? No, maybe no, Boisson? so, it, no. um, anyway. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll rem remember his name. If he, if his, if his name was an insect, I would remember his name, but, <laughs> um, anyway, he had the first visual in this, this book was an enormous circle. And beside the circle was a dot. And under the dot, it said the sum total of human knowledge. <laughs> The big circle was everything else, you know. And part of the problem that we're in as a culture is we keep be making decisions on the basis of that dot. And that's what, you know, coming back to students, that's what students are examined on, is that dot. Yeah. And, and the great big, and the dot is concerned with what I call cleverness and and very much left brain sort of things and the big circle is 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 where wisdom and experience and intuition and you know indigenous ways of knowing women's ways of knowing all those other things are and where my grandfather's knowing that today was the day to plant the taters <laughs> came yeah. from and that was my experience in, in going around the country, meeting with farmers, uh, well, all around the world. And what became really clear was that the really good farmers were people who worked with their were and are <laughs> and, and not with the dot, you know, and, um, and when they worked with the dot, they kept getting surprises. Oh gosh, you know, how come the plants aren't growing? Or how come, um, we're getting attacked by insects? Or how come, you know, we can't market the stuff or whatever it is, you know, whereas the, the, uh, the person who was tuned into the big circle and the wisdom and the experience, um, they were constantly smiling. <laughs> And yeah. that, that big circle is what's connected to joy and wonder and mystery and learning, you know, that all those farmers were learning every day. They were out there. Whereas the people who were stuck on the dot were stuck on controlling everything. And when you're, you know, you're focused on controlling everything, there's no chance to, to be, um, excited and, and learning, you know. And one of the, one of the experiences I particularly remember was an old farmer in, um, in the New England area who used to teach, um, using horses for cultivation. And he had a quite a successful son who was, had, had a lot more equipment. And the son said to him one day, you know, dad, why don't you let me come over and clean out all those rocks in your fields with my rock lifter? 
And he, the, the old farmer looked at him for a long time and he said, no. He said, but why, you know, I see you stop every time you come to one of those rocks. And he said, yeah, that's when I look at the farm and I think about the amazing things around me and I learn about the things I see. And if I had all those rocks removed, I wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> and so, you know, I think there's lots of different expressions of this phenomena. And um, in psychology, um, it's, it's sometimes advanced as the concept of pausing, you know, because we rush, 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 rush. And so just the idea of, of pausing, like as a, as a therapist, I worked as a psychotherapist and, you know, you listen to a client and the client says, oh, this, this happened to me. You know, as a therapist, you have answers to all these things, you know. Well, if you actually just stop and pause and listen for a bit, usually what comes up is, a, is another question to ask, <laughs> not, not a solution to offer. And yeah. that's what takes you into a deeper understanding. And so in some ways, what I'm talking about is, is the difference between shallow management and living and engagement and deeper, broader, tangential, unknowing ways of engaging with things. You, um, quite a few years ago coined the phrase deep organic and shallow organic. Yeah. Which I think is very much what you're talking about here. Could you describe that for people who have never heard that conversation, please? Well, when I started looking at this, I was particularly looking at the problems associated with pesticide use in agriculture. And the question was, how do we reduce the negative impacts of pesticides? And the first strategy was to use the pesticide more efficiently because with pesticides, you know, all the studies showed that, that 90% uh, or nearly 99% maybe of the pesticide actually doesn't hit the target. It, it hits everything else. And so the first strategy that I thought about was how can you use those pesticides more efficiently? to use less of them. And so if you monitor the pest and you only apply the pesticide when you've got a pest that's reached a threshold level of pest, um, which incidentally um, is quite interesting that um, I remember looking at lucerne or alfalfa. Um, I think you had to get, I think it was something like 20 or 30 percent defoliation before it was worth applying anything to control the alfalfa weevil. And in fact, a 4 percent defoliation uh, gives you greater production than zero, <laughs> zero defoliation. Um, so Why a lot is of that. <laughs> well, because, because what happens, because uh, life responds to challenge. And when the, the, the alfalfa is nibbled a bit, it actually fights back and it fights back more than it's been nibbled. <laughs> and so a lot of plants actually do better when they're being nibbled a bit than when they're um, not being nibbled. I think the, the really interesting one for, f on this for me was working in forestry, um, where, um, the, the, the aphids that attacked the, the leaves drip, um, their, their, uh, sugary solution out of their rear ends onto the leaf litter. And that enables a fungus to start growing called, uh, a sugar fungus, mucor hymalis. And, um, that fungus is absolutely essential for the beginning of the decomposition process of the litter of the trees. So you need that sugar falling down from the insects eating the, the, the leaves 
or w with their mouth parts stuck into the leaves to get the decomposition process going. So if you go and spray those trees and get rid of all those aphids, then you stop the decomposition process from functioning properly. But anyway, um, so there are lots of efficiency strategies. I got quite interested in, um, in uh, better, better nozzles on the sprayer, you know, and better, better applications where you could um, charge the particle coming out of the, the sprayer so that it actually goes around and hits it hits the plant instead of going all over everywhere and so there there are lots of efficiency things you can do um, but I realized would these would these have been called integrated pest management was this the beginning of IPM um, well really the IPM was the next stage was so that's the efficiency stage the next stage was the substitution stage and the the uh, curative strategies. So you, you um, maybe substitute a biological control for a pesticide um, along with the efficiency strategies. Um, and, um, and so we see the whole development of pathogens for killing insects and biological controls of uh, praying mantids and, and ladybugs and parasitic wasps and all these sort of things. And, you know, what, what I kept in mind was a bit like the, um, the doctor's thing of not having a headache because of a deficiency of aspirin in the blood. You didn't actually have pests because of a deficiency of praying mantids in the field. <laughs> um, it, it was something else that was causing the, the occurrence of the pest. Um, and so paradoxically, the use of all those substitutes was protecting and perpetuating the design that was generating the problem. So I eventually realized that what we've got to do is, is think about design and design needs to take into account not just how do you design the use of a curative response, but how do you design the whole system? So, you know, you have to ask what is food production and what does it involve? Well, it involves selecting a site, planting the plant, maintaining the site, which involves irrigation and fertilizers and soil management and the timing of all operations and the cho choice of the varieties and the, um, the management of the accompanying environment and, you know, whether you're going to have companion plants and multi-story systems and all the rest of it. And it's very much, um, a, a pr an issue of, of asking who's involved, what's involved, and when do you do things, and where do you do things, and how do you do things? And it's it's like a um, like flying a plane. There's there's numerous you know when you look at the knobs on the in the cockpit, there's numerous knobs, and they've all got to be twiddled in the right way to for the plane to keep going. Well, it's pretty much the same story with designing at the front end, an agro ecosystem that can be sustainable and healthy and viable and, and so forth. Um, and so what I realized was there were actually two groups of people in organics who were selling their produce as organic. There were people who were practicing what I'd call substitution organics or shallow organics that was still back end organics and then mm -hmm. there were the people who were at the front end who were trying to design agro ecosystems to prevent the problems and <clears throat> they were very different sorts of people because their whole sense of time and place was quite different and their engagement with the big picture or the or the dot you know <laughs> was quite different um so, and, and the whole market was in favor of substitution organics or shallow organics. 
Okay, so, you know, there is, a, a, I think, a somewhat critical question for our species, which is why is it that our economic system so favors substitution agriculture? Why is it that it so favors the McDonald's model of like we made the little patties someplace and we shipped them frozen someplace and we've added the flavor someplace and all you got to do is sit here and make sure that those burgers get put in the little bags and and McDonald's makes a fortune doing that selling in my opinion terrible food that is bad for people bad for the community so why why is it why are we stuck on that right well it's you know historically um, there, there's a man called Lloyd de Maus who said, if you want to understand the history of humanity, you need to look at the history of how we raise children. And historically, early humans um, actually killed children that weren't, didn't, didn't look like they were going to be up to the mark, you know. And then we, we went into a phase of, of, uh, sending children away you know they weren't they weren't kept in a family they were um used for for labor or whatever even people often don't realize that um in the elizabethan era in britain children didn't actually eat with their parents they mostly served their parents and then they were given what was ever left over from the parents <laughs> And when I was brought up, I was sent away to boarding school, you know, so it was still in that mode of, of controlling children. Um, and when you, when you are in a, an era of control, um, you want to set up institutional systems that make it easy to make decisions. And so gradually we set up through industrialization, um, and, um, and, and our whole sort of political system of, of markets and globalization and so forth has, have all been set up with, with an attraction to easy ways of making decisions. So money was the easiest way to make decisions. Whereas, um, making decisions on what would be best for the, the health and well-being of individuals and societies was much, much more complicated. And so when you say to politicians, oh, we need to change things, their approach is, well, how do we change those things to make it economically rational to make that decision? Well, actually, we don't need to make it on the basis of, of, um, of money. Money is a tool just like a shovel or a, a plow is a tool. It needs to be seen as in the service of enabling well-being and vitality and all those sort of things. So that's the big challenge that we face. And it's sort of, it's starting to, to become evident even in our understanding of economics, there's a whole group of people who uh, advocate what's called modern monetary theory, which basically challenges the idea that um, when we've got a, an issue like COVID and, and bushfires and so forth, um, that the government's got to do a whole lot of spending. And the assumption is that taxpayers are going to be forced to pay back the debt. <laughs> Now, modern monetary theory says actually no. The, the whole issue of money is that government can produce money. It, it can print money. It, it can build up a debt, but it's not a debt that necessarily needs to be paid back by, by taxpayers. It needs to be paid back by making wiser decisions and stop doing some things that, that are a waste of money. You know, and you see this. I mean, a friend of mine was a nutritionist, Ross Hume Hall. He wrote a great book called Food for Naught. And he said, if you want to understand this whole food system, just go into the supermarket and you can see the, the, the situation of how the whole economic system is functioning. Around the perimeter, 
there's a little bit of food. You know, down one side you've got fruits and vegetables and then another you've got meats and in the corner you've got the bread. And then in the middle you've got some, some really evil sort of things that, that are terrible things. But, but 80% of it is food that makes a noise that when you pour milk on it, you know, that sort of stuff that you have no requirement for. And it's all compensatory consumption. It's, it's, um, things that make you feel all right or that give you a bit of ease and so forth. And he said, you know, as a nutritionist, I could advise you about nutrition, but the simple piece of advice I would give you is keep out of the center aisles. You know, just eat, yeah. buy from the perif periphery. Well, if you think of that 80% that's rubbish, basically, that's compensatory for our misery, <laughs> Um, and you stop producing that 80% and you, you start focusing on the 10% that's, that's what is actually bringing health and well-being. Um, then there's plenty of money available in our society. And that, you know, it, it's a, it's a transition from that back end economics driven, globalized, cheapness approach to everything to a front end what do we value and how can we enable meeting those values okay so Stu we are facing a new challenge in our time which is that they're starting to make the food around the edge also be uh, not quite food um, 99% I have read of the meat, milk, and eggs in America comes from concentrated animal feeding operations, what we call confinement livestock right. operations. Right. And now we're seeing more and more of the vegetables and the berries are coming from hydroponic producers, even under the organic seal. So. Yeah. You know, I, I think for right now we're probably at a majority of the tomatoes and, and maybe a majority of the berries are coming hydroponic and 90%. I think I've read over 50% of the organic milk and over 75% of the certified organic. Certified yeah. organic eggs are coming from CAFOs. Yeah. So could you talk about... What that means to you is, can a CAFO be good food and can it be part of a, of a ecological farming system that will sustain the planet and the people for generation after generation? I think that's, that's exactly right. And, you know, it, I mean, it just tells you how rapidly that's happened since, since Ross Hume Hall wrote that book, Food for Naught. Um, where most of that produce was not that nature, or at least not, not in anywhere other than the United States. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so you can predict that's what, what the system would do. It would, it would realize we've got to colonize the whole system, you know, and we've got to manipulate that with regulations and codes and, and so forth. And I remember, early on thinking about it, well, one of the strategies to address that is to require um, incredibly comp comprehensive labeling, you know, so that if you had to label um, all produce and include all the agricultural operations that were carried out that uh, might have an impact on health, <laughs> Uh, you know, people would stop, some people would stop buying a lot of that, that stuff. Or even if you could label the worst things, you know, and were forced to label the worst things. Um, and for the consumer, uh, really increasingly the only choice is to buy directly from the producer or to grow their own. And that, you know, eventually, I think as a, as a society, we're going to say, um, this is, this is not easy for a lot of people. And there's, there's going to be a growing number of people who actually are getting sicker and sicker and, um, 
and and more and more aware of 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 what's going on and will start to make that change but the the issue of change is uh, most change occurs in response to crises and um, the the problem is that some of these crises that we're facing now are getting to the point where some of them are irreversible like loss of species you know i mean we're talking a lot about climate change i actually think much much more important than climate change is biodiversity loss because all those other organisms are actually maintaining the planet to make it habitable by humans mostly in ways that we have no idea what they're doing and we're indiscriminately eliminating them um, and and their job um, there's no, no nobody able to take over that work you know if we lose that species doing that job um, that job can't get done anymore um, and you know, it's, it's a big challenge to get the population to realize that um, to, because we've been brainwashed into thinking that simplification and control is the way to, way to live, you know. But, I mean, the, st know, the mm -hmm. statistics for the, the burdening of the mental health system with misery and breakdown <laughs> is a really good feedback. So I remember having to write a report on all this thing for a, a, a government years, years ago, way back in the 70s. And I was faced with this massive data and complexity, you know, because there are sort of three stages we go through in thinking about these things. The first is deceptive simplicity, like the, the pesticide for the pest and the aspirin for the headache. The next stage is confusing complexity, where you realize there's a whole lot of things involved in, in what leads to these things. The third phase is, is profound simplicity, which is what is the wise, doable thing that can be done, the best thing that can be done at this moment in this particular place um, that is consistent with the well-being of the whole system and um, I said to my dreams I was recording dreams at this time and I said to my dream explain to me the profound simplicity uh, that can break through all this complexity I'm wrestling with and in the middle of the night I woke up with three words and those words were integration, balance, and feedback. And integration was clear to me that we needed to integrate our way of being on the planet with, with the, the diversity and the complexity of ecosystems and nature and all this sort of stuff. And balance was pretty clear because balance is what we need to aim at instead of control. You know, like integration is, is, is instead of separation and isolation, you know, seeing ourselves as part of nature. Uh, balance is instead of control is, 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 is like, um, you know, if you think of GDP, gross national balance <laughs> is what mm. we need to aim at. Um, Feedback was not ever so clear to me at sort of two in the morning when I woke up. And so I said to my dream, explain feedback. And for the, re for the next dream, a woman took me on a tour of garbage dumps, <laughs> which was pretty much the feedback for the way we're living. You know, we, we live inappropriately yeah. and then we cart away all the byproducts of our inappropriate way of living away from where we can see it, you know, and it's, it's most far away from the wealthiest people and a little bit nearer the poor people. <laughs> and so the people making decisions 
have no awareness of the feedback of the way we're living. You know, just imagine that all the waste we produce, you had to keep in your house. You know, you'd very quickly um, start changing the way you lived. So we've got, and that's, you know, raises the question, how do you redesign the system to, to reduce the waste? You know, how do you, how do you recycle the waste? How do you, um, you know, so, so your house isn't getting filled up with unrecyclable <laughs> waste materials, yeah. which is essentially the planet. And where this really became clear to me was I had a job at one point to make a whole island self-sufficient in food and energy, which was in the Seychelles. It was a, a, an island that was a coralline island, half a mile long, I mean, a mile long and half a mile wide. And, um, and underneath that island was a little lens of fresh water that was our total supply of fresh water to, to drink. And it was very clear to me on that island that you couldn't use a pesticide because it would go into that lens of fresh water and you'll be drinking it the next day. And you couldn't overuse that water because if you pulled out too much water, it sucked in the seawater and the whole island would be contaminated with salt water. And so in a way that island provided a model for the whole planet because the island was actually just a small version of the whole planet. And so we shouldn't be putting those pesticides into the planet because somewhere it's being pulled out and people are consuming it. And if you pull out too many resources, um, you run out of the resource or you destroy the resource. So we've, that island provided me with a model of how do you manage that island so it can go on living forever and ever you know, and, and support people. And it involves three things for our species. Like if I'm studying another species, I ask three questions, well, four questions. How many are there? How are they distributing themselves? What are they doing? And what's their relationship with the support environment? And what's very clear is for our species, we've got to actually reduce our numbers. We've got to live close to the resources we use, not far away from the resources we use. And there's some things we've got to decide we can do and can't do. And we've got to do that in relation to the carrying capacity of the environment. So, you know, if you look at what are the things we've got to manage for our future, it's our numbers, our distribution, and our activities. And those activities need to be uh, tuned in to the support, uh, support capacity of the environment. Now, I don't see any political system anywhere <laughs> that's understood that. Even, even alternative uh, environmental groups like um, zero population growth and, and and, and, and the various environmental groups, most of them don't actually look at distribution. Distribution is a massively impacting thing, you know, with our whole focus on cities, enormous cities that we have trucks coming into to carry farm produce in. And there's no trucks going out from the cities, taking the organic matter back to the land of the farm you know, for example. Um, so, so we cities, cities are like large CAFOs. Yeah, they are. They're, you know, and I mean, I've had so many, been fortunate to have so many experiences that, that validate my understanding of these various things. I remember when I first came to Quebec, uh, organochlorides were banned, you know, DDT and and all those um, organochloride chloride pesticides. And I remember saying to uh, somebody in the government, what are you doing with all these uh, pesticides? Because they didn't have a system for getting rid of them. And he said, well, um, 
don't tell anybody this, but we're actually putting them all down a mine shaft in in Quebec. <laughs> well, that mine shaft would have a water course that went through it. <laughs> and, you know, and I remember, you know, when the, when the organic chlorides were banned, um, they were banned in North America, but they weren't stopped production. So all the people producing them continued to send them to Africa to control mosquitoes and so forth. Well, the air currents in the tropics carried all those pesticides up into the air and in, you know, moved in a circular movement. And those air currents came down in the poles, in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And when the air came down and cooled, it dumped all that pesticide. And so, um, Eskimos, for example, in, in the Arctic, um, had higher levels of chlorinated hydrocarbons in the breast milk, such that it was no longer safe to feed breastfeed children, even though those Eskimos had never used pesticides. Um, and so it's a good example of just a whole culture not understanding ecology and, and the interconnectedness of everything and how we need to make decisions at the front end, which means not, not better marketing of, of the produce, but, you know, or the chemical, but, um, making a decision. Actually, it's not, it's not, acceptable to even use a product that isn't going to break down because if it isn't going to break down it's going to accumulate and it's toxic it's going to accumulate to the point where it's toxic to important things that we need to maintain the well-being of our species and other species and the planet you know so it, it is a um, a big challenge to think how we're going to transform all that sort of process and that's partly why I'm particularly focusing these days on education on you know how do we transform our education systems to teach children about this whole 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 of life uh, understanding and interrelationships and so forth so it's a it's a massive transformation of the education system, which it's a sort of parallel to my deep organics. It's um, deep front end complexity, enabling, like our education system now is run like conventional agriculture where, where there's control. So we've got students sitting in rows uh, being controlled and told what they have to learn um, and being tested on what they've been t told to learn. Um, well, humans are a learning organism. We don't need to be made to learn. We actually want to learn. <laughs> but we want to learn what we want to learn, not what somebody wants to tell us. <laughs> so we need to be enabled to learn, not controlled to learn. <laughs> And so that's a complete transformation of our education system. And there are so some I, schools that are doing that called democratic schools. Yeah. It sounds like we need a real education movement, a real education project, as well as a real organic project. I'm, I'm struck, you know, as we talk about science and the science you're talking about is so beautiful to me. And so often in these, debates and conversations science is used by corporations as a weapon yeah and they're saying well this is science based and you know they've they've done the same thing with science which is sort of denature it and strip off everything and you're left with white flour and you know they choose and pick the little pieces of scientific research that they want that supports their i think very limited point of view and their point of view is completely based on how to make money Absolutely. Um, it's funny. Yeah. It, it's interesting for me growing up in England because I got um, taken to lots of old castles and all these castles had little slits in the walls that you sh could shoot an arrow through. 
Yeah. And then I realized this is how we conduct science. Um, we look at the world through these narrow slits. And of course, all the things that affect what, what's going on out there, you don't see because you've, you've limited the, the, the vision. And, um, when I was a student, it was interesting how, um, there was a man called Beveridge who wrote a book called The Art of the Scientific Method. And we all had to study his, his writings. And it was about how do you set up a controlled experiment where you, you mm -hmm. control all the variables and you limit the variables. So only one thing is affecting one thing. And that's the thing you can measure and you can get nice graphs of highly reproducible outcomes from and so forth, which has nothing to do with reality. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's how do you do these experiments? And it's what all this evidence-based decision-making and controlled science is, is based on. Well, interestingly, late in his life, um, he realized he'd forgot the rest. <laughs> and he wrote another book, um, which, um, was about, you know, how do you, how do you look outside of that? And particularly, he realized that he'd forgotten about creativity and discovery and, um, you know, not, not how do you do an experiment, but how do you discover something and learn about a, a whole system? And, um, that, um, unfortunately, most scientists are still only reading the first type of book, not the second type of book. And in the, in the second book, he cited, he included referring to people like Edward de Bono's lateral thinking and Kersler's ideas and, you know, the role of art and, uh, and outside the box thinking in all these sort of things. Um, so, I, I certainly noticed it and it, for me, it's, it's been a, a real difficulty in getting funding for research. Like I was wanting to study the role of soil animals in, in the soil. And, um, first of all, um, you know, the, there was the sort of test, well, what it, what's the importance of these things? you know, other than earthworms, there was pretty much no appreciation of any animals in the soil. Um, but those animals were actually farming the system. So I started studying mites and how they're farming fungi. And, this, you know, in terms of understanding the soil, they actually told me more about the soil than any textbook you know, about the, had about soil, like what these mites were doing. And there might, in an average soil, there might be a hundred and something different species of mites. And each of them was essentially farming a different species of fungus, the hyphae of which they were preferring to feed on. And they fed on the hypha of the fungus, but not on the spores, but they'd eat the whole thing. And the, the fungus that they've eaten would go through their gut and they would digest the, the stalk, as it were, the hypha, but the spores would survive. So, um, when they pooed, they pooed out a little bit of what essentially was potting soil with a, with a spore of the fungus it preferred to feed on in the poo. Um, so that, and they were dropping that poo all over the place in the in the soil uh, and those those spores were germinating and producing more food for that for that species of mite and not only that was uh, unlike us they when they poo they cast off the lining of their gut called the peritrophic membrane which actually has a bit of an antibiotic in it and it stops competitive fungi from growing on that potting soil <laughs> that the, the mite, it wants, wants it to produce its own food and not somebody else's food. And not only that, that they have very complex hairs on their bodies. And when you look at the structure of those hairs, um, they're quite complex. And if that mite 
walked through a field of a whole lot of different species of fungi, the structure on that hair is, set, is such that it will preferentially pick up the spores of the species of fungus it prefers to feed on. And so as it walks through the environment, it's distributing that that species of fungus that is the food for the for the mite. So they've been doing that for 400 million years. You know, they've been farming in a very specific and complex way. And in a way that all their neighbors are farming in a different way, but in a way that is not competitive with them, that is, is complementary to them. And so by all those mites doing that farming, the breakdown of the organic matter, which requires the activity of a whole diversity of different fungi, is ensured to be able to occur. So that breakdown of the organic matter um, can proceed by having a high diversity of those mite farmers <laughs> in the soil. Now, even most people teaching soil ecology have essentially minimal understanding of what I've just described. Um, yes. And sadly, most soil microbiologists have pretty much no understanding of what I've just described. And they're trying to um, understand decomposition uh, from a microbiological understanding, um, which is very difficult to do because it's, it's a lot easier to, to count mites in the soil. And because you get, you, you, you get a, a measure of the diversity of mites and the numbers of each of them, you then have an accurate measure of the actual activity of the fungi that they're feeding on. Whereas if you try and measure the fungi, what you tend to measure is the potential of, of the spores and the, the, the microbes, but not actually their activity. <laughs> Whereas the mites will tell you their actual activity because the amount of mites is proportional to the amount of activity of the different species of fungi. And it's the same with relationship between nematodes and protozoa and bacteria. And um, so bacteria are a bit easier to measure than, uh, than, than fungi. But even if you measure bacteria, you're primarily measuring um, all, all bacteria, all stages of bacteria, whether they're um, active or not, you know, when you put them on a, on a plate or when you measure them, um, you don't know whether they're active. Whereas if you look at the amount and species of nematodes, that gives you a, a measure of, of how much bacteria are active. And what you need, of course, in a soil is a great diversity of bacteria and a great diversity of, of fungi and, and, um, and actinomycetes, which are another group. And it's the, it, it, it's the, um, I mean, if you look at decomposition, you could look at it a bit like a relay race in the Olympics, you know, that you, you've got things that are, breaking down the sugars and then the, the starches and then the, the more complex things. And, you know, each of those microbes is carrying out specific functions that are involved in the overall breakdown of the leaf and, or, or the organic matter. And not just the breakdown, but in the production of the glues, the, the gums that hold the soil together and the release of the nutrients and the trace minerals. And um, the, 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 the trace minerals are particularly important. And one of the big mistakes in agriculture um, was to realize um, that you could increase production by putting on superphosphate. And um, the reason primarily that superphosphate was put on so much was that 
it's not released, phosphorus isn't released early enough in the season because its release is temperature related. So people put on superphosphate to make it available, not because there wasn't phosphorus in the soil, but because it wasn't in an available form at the time when you wanted to get the plant started. Now, when you put phosphate on, that superphosphate ties up your trace minerals. <laughs> so it doesn't only release that, it, 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 it uh, removes the trace minerals. And, um, and so we end up with imbalanced soils. And so we need to enable the mycorrhizae to be really active because Mycorrhizae are the, the group of microorganisms that are particularly involved in the mobilization of trace minerals. And um, one of their favorite foods is chitin. And chitin is what's in the bodies of those dead mites. And um, so, for example, in my compost heap, I always put all my seafood um, shells, you know, shrimp and prawn and crab and lobster shells, um, primarily to enable the mycorrhizae to uh, become really abundant in my compost. And so, so these are sort of understandings that, you know, people who've, who got involved in that deep organics front end approach are, are including in their um, their, their set of processes that they carry out to enable well-functioning of the system. And it can seem like, well, that's not an important thing. But, you know, the activity of mycorrhizae is a really, really important thing <laughs> if you want to have molybdenum and cobalt and man manganese and, and iron and so forth available in the soil. And you want to have them available in the soil so that the plant is healthy. So the plant can can have, just like, you know, having an interesting meal, um, that you don't just give them one thing on the plate. You know? <laughs> they need to be able to shop from the full shelf of all the various things that are available. And, um, and could you, could you, yeah. Could you describe, Stu, how, what the plant gives back? In, in other words, this is an exchange. This is a cycle. So how does that work, the relationship between the soil animals and the microbes? You've talked about that, but where does the plant come into this? Because we in our agriculture at this point, we're basically just looking at the plant. We, conventional agriculture, yeah. is saying, okay, we see these plants. We've got a big, big yield of corn here. Here's your money. You're going to make it for another year. And we're talking about a, something different here. We're talking about a different discussion. Yeah. Well, the, I mean, the plant is part of, a, of that recycle system. So what, what you put into the plant, it passes on through consumption and, and, and incorporation of the waste back into the soil. So if you haven't put the good things into the plant, it's not passing on good things to the consumer and back to the soil. Um, and, and, you know, plant roots while they're growing are producing a whole lot of things in soil that are really important for the microbes in the soil. Um, but if that plant isn't getting what it needs out of that soil to, to carry out that maintenance function, you know, the production bit that we harvest is, is a minor part of what the plant's doing. Um, most of the plant is, is theoretically going back into the soil, you know, um, and, um, I think that was one of the mistakes of the green revolution. The, the people who got into the green revolution saw this, this, uh, wheat growing up here. And there's this little bit, the 10% that's the grain on the tip of the stem. And, um, and they said, oh, well, if we can shorten the stem, um, and put more into the bit we harvest, it's going to be more efficient. Well, the stem is actually what maintains the soil. <laughs> and so 
when you when you deprive the soil of the maintenance bit then that that and you cut off the the uh, you mark it off the 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 seed somewhere else um you set up an un, un unsustainable system and so that um seeing that whole thing as a cycle is really really important um and yeah, it's it. So I'm hearing that um, we have several challenges that are very important for us as a species. And uh, one of them is to see the ecology, the system. Yeah. And um, even with great, uh, you mentioned great soil microbiologists might not really uh, get the involvement of all the soil animals, of all the insects, and and even down to I just saw a woodchuck run by. So even down to the big big soil animals, yeah. that that the necessary role, the critical role that they play in this system with the plants and the sunshine and and all these soil animals and all these microbes, and I I get that it's it's almost overwhelming to even contemplate this level of complexity. Well, there are ways to, to understand it. Just like, you know, people have said, you know, we need to go and measure all the species out in the environment to understand its complexity. And some of the early ecologists said, well, actually, there's a, a much easier way to do this because the presence of top predators tells you everything that's further down in the food chain. You know, if you've got eagles flying over or cougars wandering around in the forest and so forth, for them to be there, it means you've got to have all the things that they feed on and all the things that they feed on have got to have all the things that they feed on <laughs> right down to the whole thing. So those are called integrator indicators. They tell you the whole system. And, you know, in, in, um, in a lot of institutions, interestingly, um, the, the woman who brings around the coffee often tells you more about the healthy functioning of the corporation than anybody else, <laughs> because they're the only one who still goes to every department <laughs> and, and senses what's going on. And usually mm. the, the, the woman who goes around with the coffee can tell you more about the health of the, of the corporation than anybody else. Just so they're an integrator indicator. Um, now in soil, the top predators are a group of mites called mesostigmatid mites. They're predators. And by actually knowing the, the species of mesostigmatid mites, um, gamasus and, and all sorts of, and they're all their friends, uh, you can actually tell how healthy the soil is without yes. having to I, go and look at everything else. And um, a German professor, Karg, realized this way back in the uh, 60s, probably wrote a paper about this, which hasn't been picked up by virtually anybody. Um, and I wrote a paper about it looking at um, at, at how we how we manage soil, taking into account this sort of thing, and and using this approach. So, if anybody wants that that paper that tells you all this stuff that I've just been talking about, um, essentially that paper would would put put your finger on it. And I even wrote a popular one for a magazine called Mind Your Mites. <laughs> <laughs> So you could look, so, you could Google that. So I, I am um, struck by um, it's been said that that uh, more than once that organic farmers are just a bunch of luddites, and actually it was said of us in the in the debate over whether or not hydroponic production could be called organic and people who who uh, wanted hydroponic production to be certified said oh uh, 
they're just a bunch of Luddites. Right. They don't believe in innovation. They don't believe in science. And as I listen to you talk, Stu, I, I have felt, I've always felt, and I still feel, like I know very little of what I do, and I've been a farmer all my life, and I have discovered what works. And, you know, I, I'm very respectful of the soil, and I do my best, but I feel like we're just at the beginning of just beginning to learn about how to do this well, and how to honor these systems, and how to work with them, in a cooperative fashion. And it's not that we need less science and it's not that we want to stop learning. It's that we want more science focused on how to be respectful of the soil ecosystem. Absolutely. Would you agree with that? Y yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, like the science that I've been describing is in a sense like the organics I'm advocating. It's deep science. Um, whereas the science that has become dominant has become shallow science. Um, you know, yeah. I, I mean, somebody said modern science you could characterize as taking a chemical and injecting it into a mouse and seeing what it happens in the mouse and writing a paper about that. Um, you know, so what? You know, well, so much of science is essentially doing that sort of thing that's got very little relevance to what one needs science for, which is to understand how whole systems are functioning and, you know, in an intentional way, how do we in engage with them and, and manage them and design them to enable them to function really well. And um, that, that's not the science that gets funded and that gets taught. It's, it's shallow science that primarily is being taught. And, um, and in, in education, pretty much all the subjects are being taught as shallow subjects, not deep subjects. Um, and they're, they're yeah. often being taught in a way that's highly controlled. So for example, our students in social ecology um, were, were able to follow their own projects. So they designed their own projects. They had no exams. Um, they were all doing different things and they were evaluated on those projects and presentations and collaboration and, and papers that they wrote about their learning and their diaries of their learning and things like this. So I, we were enabling learning tuned in to the learning edge of the student, the learning agenda of the student. Um, whereas conventional education is, is just um, an, a, a manipulation. And historically, you can see where it came from. It was producing um, workers for an industrial machine that you wanted identical uh, individuals predictably behaving in the same way to operate a machine that is not flexible. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and what we need now, very clearly, is a, a whole wise um, person who can tune in to a whole system and be tuned into what's the best thing to do at this moment given the resources available to bring about these best outcomes and so forth. Well, what we educate people for now doesn't prepare them to do that. And so you can see why they would choose to say, you know, if, if you can't do something, quite often what happens is you attack people who do, you know. And I mean, this is, is an explanation of why leaders invariably get attacked is, is not, I mean, sometimes appropriately, but, but often it's, it's a, a knee jerk sort of reaction as a, as an expression of, of an acknowledgement of my failure, my leadership failure <laughs> is if I can't be a leader, I'm going to attack leaders. You know, if I can't yeah, yeah. practice my simplified system of agriculture, I'll attack those people who are doing it in a 
front end design approach and we'll label them in a, in a discriminatory way, Luddites, you know. I mean, what's interesting for me is following a lot of those very early uh, pioneers of organic farming in America, a lot of them were the leaders of using pesticides. And so because they were the leaders of using pesticides, they were the first people to realize the, the mistake of using pesticides. And then they were the leaders of finding another way to do it. And so they were far from Luddites, you know, that some of those people said, you know, I sudden, some of those people who didn't get into pesticides said, um, you know, I realized I was so far behind that I was ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and that's in a way, you know, one of the learnings we have to, to get is, is what is ahead and ahead isn't, isn't a pathway towards co ecosystem collapse and, 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 you know, resource exhaustion and global contamination and degradation and climate change and, and breakdown and misery <laughs> and all the various things yeah. which we can see. So these, you know, in my earlier thing, integration, balance and feedback, all those things that are going on that are, we're seeing as problems are the feedback that yeah. we need to redesign yeah. the system. And instead yeah. of what we see it conventionally is all that feedback is treated as an enemy to be eliminated. And so yes. somebody who objects to, um, hydroponic organics is seen as an enemy to be eliminated just as a pest to be eliminated. And really the, the, those things that appear need to be seen as, as indicators of maldesign and mismanagement of a system that needs to be redesigned and managed as a complex system, particularly to emphasize maintenance over production. So the paradox is, if you think about how to maintain a system, you establish a system for sustained high production. Whereas if you focus on production, you, you get a system that you get declining production over time because of the neglect of maintenance. And inevitably in that system with the decline, you also get uh, a declining health in the, in the people who are living and feeding off that system. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's inferior nutritionally. So everything, you know, is an indicator. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, oh dear, I've got a headache, you know. Ah, so what, what's that an indicator of? Not how do I kill the headache, you know. It's like crime in our society is, is an indicator of, of inequity and failure to, to deal with enabling people to realize their potential, you know, yeah. like people want to be loving, caring, collaborative and so forth. Even, even our democratic system, you know, we think of democracy. Well, democracy is, is actually 50 plus one. You know, it's the, the power of the majority over the minority. What we need is an evolution, you know, from autocracy to democracy, but then to the next stage, which is cooperacy. Mm. And one of my students wrote a book called Cooperacy. And that's what, in a sense, we're advocating in a, a, a healthy agroecosystem is a cooperacy between all those organisms and just as we need in society. All right, one last question, Stuart. Um, <laughs> and, and we could talk for a very long time. There's so much that we haven't gotten to that, that we have talked about before and I would love to go back to. But one last question for today. Uh, Jonathan Sanford Fora wrote a book called We Are the Weather. And Jonathan is a very excellent writer and a very interesting thinker. I, I actually,
think he kind of left out regenerative agriculture when he wrote the book. He left out animals as being a very important part of ecosystems. But uh, he just did a beautiful job of describing the real tragedy of CAFO agriculture, which is most of what uh, Americans get for meat, milk, and eggs. And he also does an amazing job of describing the difference between knowledge and belief. Right. And he, you know, he tells this wonderful story, it's a, a, a sad story of um, somebody who escapes from the, from the Warsaw Ghetto in World War II, uh, a Jewish refugee, and he comes to America, very perilous journey, and he gets a, a meeting with Felix Frankfurter on the Supreme Court. And he talks to him for two hours about what's happening in, in the Warsaw Ghetto, where there's just, you know, people are being exterminated. And at the end of it, Frankfurter looks at him and says, I'm sorry, but I don't believe you. And the guy goes, you don't believe me? And he says, I know you're telling me the truth, but I just can't believe it. Yeah. It's, it's too horrible. I can't believe it. Yeah. And... You know, he goes on and in some detail about the difference for all of us. He's not pointing a finger at anybody. The difference for all of us between knowing something and believing on it. And in, you know, we, we have so many things that you've talked about that we believe. Many people, millions and millions of people. And yet we have trouble changing our lives because of it. You know, we have trouble changing our world because of it. Um, I once heard a guy, uh, actually somebody that will be in the, in the symposium, David Grinspoon, he wrote the book Earth in Human Hands, and he gave a great talk at Dartmouth College. And afterwards, I was talking to a good friend of mine who's a professor there, and I said, what did you think? And he said, yeah, that was great. And I said, did you agree with what he said? Because he was saying that we're facing an extinction event as a species. And did you agree? And he said, yes, I do. I said, do you think a lot of the faculty agrees with him? He says, yes, I think most of the faculty agrees with him. I said, well, then why hasn't the curriculum changed? <laughs> <laughs> really? Because it's, 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 this is World War II and worse. Yeah. And you would think that, that we would change our world and our educational institutions and, you know, in World War II, everybody had a victory garden. Half the vegetables were grown in people's victory gardens. And kids were out collecting junk metal, you know, every weekend. The world was different because of what was going on. They believed that this war was transformative and that if we didn't win, it was going to be uh, a monumental turning point to a, to a much worse life. And I, I see that we all have trouble believing that the things that you've been talking about are true. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I, it's probably enough for another hour. <laughs> um, you know, late in life, I became a psychotherapist to, to try and understand the answer to that question. And what I realized is... Um, uh, a S Scottish psychologist said, in our development, it's as if we've been hypnotized twice. Firstly, into accepting pseudo-reality as reality, and secondly, into believing we've not been hypnotized. Mm. <laughs> and so that's why that doesn't change, because we're, we're, it's like we're stuck on a conveyor belt that is keeping us doing the same thing. Um, and to, to see that, that, that reality to the point where we do something about it, um, requires us to free ourselves from the prison that we, we, we're in, in a habitual way. Um, how we get in that prison is throughout childhood, we have negative things that happen to us. And eventually that reaches a threshold where we switch usually for most kids between the age of 7 and 11, from essentially living from the inside out to living from the outside in. And so we, we sort of develop antennae that, that try to detect what's, how's the okay way to live. 
whereas the small child is still living spontaneously, you know. You, you see it if you take a kid to the supermarket and the kid, you know, pulls things off the shelf and they fall down and the parent bashes them over the head and, uh, the, and walks along a little bit more and the kid does exactly the same thing again because they still fall down if you pull one out and, <laughs> and they haven't, they haven't, you know, adapted yet to, to that. And eventually between seven and eleven, they, they adapt. Um, and you see this if you've got your photographs of you in school. In primary school, all these kids have got bright eyes. They're sort of <sighs> looking like this. And then you look at your high school pictures. There are rows of kids that look like that, you know, and they've got dead eyes. You look at the eyes, small kids have bright eyes. And after adaptation, our eyes become dead, you know, and glazed over. So all adults have dead eyes. You know, it's a very sad thing. As a teacher in university, I'm faced with a sea of dead eyes as a teacher, you know, of kids who've been treated in that way and had to adapt to survive. Well, what happens is we set up whole selves to survive. So we're not, we're not, um, Stuart and Dave. We're actually multiple Stuarts and multiple Daves. And we have a, what I call a core Stuart and a core Dave. And the only way to progress to a good future is to have a conversation between core Dave and core Stuart. Now, most conversations that go on are between the multiple adapted selves of Stuart and the multiple adapted selves of Dave, which are compromised. So if, if you say, like you say to that, or like that question to that guy, why don't you do it? Um, what happens in all those individuals who, who understood what was the good thing? When they start to do it, all those multiple selves subconsciously say, Oh, you're not going to be able to do that because you've never been able to do anything. Um, and what, what your, what are the other universities going to think about if, if we do that at our university? Uh, we won't get the students. They'll get the students. Um, we'll become, a, a niche university uh, and be allied to the organics people or the the weirdos and so all those those multiple selves subconsciously censor everything that happens moment to moment and so I've become um, involved in running workshops for farmers not to come and talk to them about all these things that I've just been talking about, but I've actually found a way to enable that change to take place. So instead of, of asking them what would they like to do, I ask them to boldly lie about what they've done that they haven't actually done. And paradoxically, if a farmer lies about what they've done that they haven't done, because it's a lie, it's their core, unwounded, unadapted self that is, is speaking. So they actually hear, get to hear that part of themselves that actually is able to do what they, they know needs to happen. And then the question is, you know, what have they actually done to, to act on that sort of stuff already? What would be a next step? What would you need to take that next doable step um, and how will you get it and who can be a support to you in taking that and what absolute commitment can you make for for doing that and how will we follow through and, and monitor that process of change. Now, what happens if you ask people what they would like to do because of all these influences of the multiple selves, they'll either say something that's meaningless um, or, or inconsequential, um, or they will, will say something to impress the person asking them that they won't actually carry through on. So, for example, the first time I did this, I asked grazier, you know, I was working with 200 graziers in Australia, which are ranchers, uh, 
Um, and the one who, who volunteered what he would do, what he wanted to do, he said he'd put a solar collector on his, uh, on his lake to, to pump the water. And um, when I went back and um, he was allowed to lie about what he'd done, this is, I'll tell you what he said. He said, and this is with Australian accent, he said, 20 years ago, I put a nature strip right through my 200,000 hectare property and I've been monitoring the bird species ever since. I've got 200 species of birds. And then with a twinkle in his eye, he said, got up this morning to monitor me birds. You know those little bloody dinosaurs? I saw one of those bastards coming out of me nature strip. Now, that's the difference between trying to bring about change by communicating with our adapted selves in the picture and communicating with our core self that is our whole in the present, fully empowered, aware, clear about values and vision self. So that's the challenge we need to address, I think, to bring about this change, is not to persuade people with argument, but to enable them to have an experience that engages with their core self. How does you, you know, how, how is your core self farming? Um, already farming as a, as a lie, you know, and yes. you know, it's, it's, uh, it has application in every area, you know, if with a teacher, tell me, lie to me how you teach, uh, the, the prime minister or the president, lie to me what you're doing as a prime minister, as a president. Um, and when you say lie to me, you mean lie to me as you wish you were. No, no, you, you lie. Lying, this, my lying is not lying as the lying we normally see. It's lying about what you're already doing, not what you would like to do or what, right. what, you, you're, have, you're, what you're, you have already done. You see, this right. guy, this guy with the, 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 um, dinosaur. Solar water. Um, he'd actually put a windbreak between two paddocks and he'd be noticing the birds on those trees. And it actually thought, if I was a bird, I'd want more than one bloody row of trees. You know, that was, and he'd, so he'd been thinking, one of these days, I'm going to put some undergrowth along that, that, that fence line and put some more trees in for those birds that I like. Well, through that process, that's what he's done now. Yeah. Yeah. He hasn't put a solar collector on his, on his pond. He's, <laughs> he's put a nature strip through his, his property. And yeah. that's the sort of transformation that we're faced with as a challenge is even us good folks are still trying to bring about the change with one arm stuck behind our back, trying to do it using the methods that are used by the people we're critiquing. <laughs> You know, yeah. getting a better marketing strategy for organics, <sighs> communicating the values of organics better. We actually need to be willing to reframe that and redesign how we're bringing about those changes. And my lying strategy <laughs> is, is the best thing I know how to do, how to do that. All right. Stuart, <laughs> we have a long way to go, but we're going to have to stop there tonight because it's getting dark in Vermont, even though it's morning in Australia. Yeah, I'm about ready so, for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thank you so much. Uh, this was a great pleasure um, and uh, a real a real treat. So thank you. Um, and we will close there. Thank you, and thank you for listening, everybody. <laughs> thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you'll subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a review on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you found us. A video version of this interview, as well as the full transcript with links related to today's conversation, is found at realorganicproject.org forward slash episode 21. Please join us next time for an interview with CEO and co-founder of Nature's Path, Aaron Stevens.
a longtime advocate of keeping organic truly organic. To find a real organic farm near you, visit realorganicproject.org forward slash farms. <laughs>